it's a think tank, it's a Community Matters, and uh, we're talking about journalism here today uh, with a, an assistant professor of the School of Communications, and that's the journalism program at the School of Communications, Brett Obergaard. Thank you for joining us, Brett. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. We Good see you all the time. <laughs> We see you in Civil Beat on a regular basis, and uh, you come down here once in a while, too. Yeah, I'm once a week in Civil Beat, every Monday. Okay, be watching on Mondays. <laughs> so uh, last week, I think it was Wednesday, um, you were a part of a, a roundtable discussion um, at East West Center that was actually uh, organized by the East, East West Center and the, and the uh, School of Communications, you, I guess, um, to discuss changes in the Honolulu news media. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting topic, you know, and Think Tech has been following it for a long time. And I wonder if you could, um, you know, give us some thoughts about why you set that program up and uh, how it went. The other speakers in the program, let's see, uh, were Patty Epler, who is the editor of Civil Beat. Um, there was supposed to be a fellow named uh, Ji Tao, uh, he runs the China Daily uh, right, yeah. News, mm -hmm. and he, he couldn't show up that day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's see, and uh, then you had, um, who am I missing? Hawaii Public Radio. Hawaii Public Radio, uh, Jose Fajardo, who was the new president of Hawaii Public Radio, taking over from uh, uh, My, uh, Michael Titterton. And, uh, and my uh, colleague, and Dr. Colleague, Ann Allman, was also Ann Allman was the there, mm -hmm. yeah, from the School of Communications. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty interesting panel. It was uh, very life. fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So I, I've only I've, I have footage, and I'm just wondering if you could summarize how it went, how it may have surprised you, what kind of conclusions uh, the panel reached, and what what kind of what did you learn that day? Okay. Well, uh, to begin with, as you know, the media environment is changing very fast. So I think what's, what um, struck me most about this panel is that all of these people on it were dealing with this change in different ways. And we were all thinking about um, how this affects our, our organizations or our, our activities and where we're going in the future. So um, I think that's going to be like this never-ending puzzle that's <laughs> going to last for a long, long time. Uh, and I think it just keeps changing faster and faster. Yeah. So the number one thing I would say is we need to be um, embracing this change and be ready for it and, and not feel like we're stuck in any particular model. I think back to when websites uh, emerged in the kind of legacy media and everybody's very excited about putting their website up and within you know five years or so of people establishing that, mobile has taken their entire audience or 50, 60 percent of their audience. So you can imagine all these people working really hard to figure out how does our web uh, site work, and then you know no five years into that, <laughs> boom, all the everybody goes to mobile. <laughs> so it's caused a lot of consternation, but um, I suspect this will just continue to happen. So yeah. we have to just kind of face it and, and embrace it, like like a lot of people are doing. Yeah. New York Times especially is, is doing a good job with that. Yeah, they're great. I, mm -hmm. I uh, read them on my telephone. Yeah. You read it on your mobile device. There yeah, you go. That's what I do. <laughs> and it takes only a minute, but I feel like I'm up to date. I'm not getting all the ads. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not getting a lot of the you know, secondary material. That's okay. But I do get the news every day, and they send a summary of news. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very it's accessible really and convenient. Yeah. And you can see why people are less and less sitting at their desktop computer and logging on to NewYorkTimes.com. They're more and more going to their... Um, Phone. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and and that just a, a, a footnote on that is that reading itself, I do in my phone. Mm -hmm. I guess I download on Kindle. I can get the latest and greatest. I can get the best sellers, you know, in ten seconds. Now I have it for relatively cheap, and I can read it wherever I go. And I, I I can actually you know keep aware of it because wherever I stop, I can read a little bit. You know, go to the next. <laughs> And right, so forth. and whenever you have what's called a mobile moment where you're waiting in line at the bank or you're yeah. uh, standing around waiting for a bus or yeah. <laughs> you know waiting at a doctor's appointment, you have all this time that uh, in the past you might have looked at a magazine on the on the table or something, but now you can you can access directly what you want to read. As news consumers, do we have a choice but to follow these new trends, um, or are we you know are we really well advised? you know, to, to keep up with it and uh, forget about the, the methodology of the past? Well, I think as an ideology, we have to maintain um, journalism 
as a, as a way we uh, think about the world. So in that respect, we should hold on to the past. We have to think about like what are our journalistic um, you, you know mantras. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how we deliver that journalism, that's the thing you know I, I recommend we just kind of let go of as much as we can without bankrupting our companies. But um, you know let go of it and say where in the future will journalism uh, be? And and a lot of people have experimented with um, just amazing new forms like uh, virtual reality and. Um, drone journalism and uh, augmented reality journalism. Mm -hmm. So people are trying these these new ways of communicating out, and they're doing um, journalism within those forms. So that's a very exciting time, I think, for journalists. Yeah, it's maybe not so exciting for ad um, sales and analog papers, but it's very exciting if you think about it as an ideology. Yeah. And as an investor, you, you really have to be especially alert because you could be investing in something in the wrong direction and lose your investment. It's like software. You know, you, you want to follow the trends so you're not going down the wrong road. <laughs> Some of them won't work. Yeah, we have to um, embrace the failures, too. Yeah. of trying things and they don't work out. Yeah. I think uh, maybe, and I haven't spent a lot of time pondering this, but uh, maybe a newspaper was envisioned like a hundred or two hundred year investment in a com as a company in the past, and now it's more like three to five years. This is what your your uh, journalistic organization is going to look like, and then it's going to be something else five years from now. So, you know, just maybe changes the way people think about it. And that and that struck me in just reading on, uh, on your discussion last week is the China Daily, uh, China Daily USA. Is, is coming or has come to Hawaii to print print press a daily print press newspaper. Um, does that seem like the right direction or does that seem like <laughs> it's the wrong direction? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know their inside business strategy, but I presume that they think that there, there's a market for people uh, who will grab that print product maybe uh, downtown in a, in a busy street or maybe somebody sitting on a bus. I mean, there's a lot of ways that analog um, media still works well. When, when you don't have good con connectivity, when, you, when uh, you know, a long battery life is needed, when um, you know, you're near water, <laughs> and those are all things that I think relate to yeah. maybe an urban life in, in uh, Honolulu. Maybe there's a place for multiple models, yeah. but surely some models have demonstrated that they will be profitable and other models have demonstrated that they will not likely be profitable for them. For example, the print press, it's not likely. And you're, uh, you can take a look at the, uh, the dailies here. They have gone down, down, down in terms of uh, readership and, and circulation. Um, and the, uh, as you said, the mobile phone aspect is going up, up, up dramatically. Mm -hmm. So if I'm an investor, um, I'm going to make a choice based on that. Uh, well, you're probably not going to uh, buy a $10 million printing press. And yeah. then try to make your money back on it. Yeah, it's yeah. not going to work. When so. you when you could very easily spend you know one one thousandth of that on a, a new startup uh, mobile news organization. Yeah, and there's plenty of room for that. I mean, Civil mm -hmm. Beat has is one methodology, and I understand they're 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 changing their news direction. Um, what I understood was that they said, or Patty Epler said, that they were going to focus on local news. Um, they were going to focus on, um, they're not going to focus so much on sports or entertainment, but local news. Um, and uh, they were, um, oh yeah, they're, they're doing citizen journalism videos mm. that you take with your cell phone. And they mm -hmm. will somehow aggregate that and make it available, um, which I think is really a good idea. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, their model hasn't changed much in terms of uh, topics they cover. I don't think they've ever covered sports or, or, or uh, entertainment, but they are um, very open to working with citizen journalists and um, people maybe outside the, the mainstream positions on, um, you know, media coverage. Yeah. So how, you know, journalism must change because of all these possibilities swirling around uh, and the need of the public to be well informed. Um, and a candidate like um, you know Donald Trump taking the press to task every time he gets a chance. If they don't support him, if they make fun of him, uh, if they give any negative reporting on him, he will take them to task, and then they, they must respond and defend themselves. Um, so journalism, journalism is in is in flux. 
and you have a school of journalism where presumably you, you cover that flux and, and you, you show those students, um, you know, to retain the old journalistic ideals, but to write differently mm -hmm. and to be in a position to influence people or at least send, send the facts or the message out in a way so that it, it has the same effect the print press used to have. You know, I mean, what do you tell them? Well, we have a lot of opportunities to um, tell stories in new ways and mm. in interactive ways. Uh, the media mm. up till this point has primarily been a one-way channel. Mm. And now there's, um, uh, there are a lot of ways to have the audience respond from reader comments to um, tips to citizen journalism. There, there are just a lot of ways to involve people in the journalistic process. And I think that that's generally healthy, although it doesn't always play out that way, depending on um, how people use that power. There have been, you know, of course, uh, a lot of folks who try to take over stories with their political, um, you know. You mean the audience, the readers? The audience, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's become a, a really serious problem. I think Twitter's struggling, struggling with it quite a bit. How, how, how does that work when they try to take over the audience? Well, they have a, kind of a grassroots organization of some sort, and if somebody says something they don't like, then they, uh, in mass, try to um, oh. blow the person out with messages, hateful messages, and... Um, misinformation posted to the site. So that's, that's one of the reasons reader comments is so hard to, to manage. Yeah. Because uh, you open that door and then, you know, where's the line you draw on what people can say? Yeah, and, and they can do things that are terribly unfair, yeah. manipulative, oh, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, and then they, like in the uh, Civil Beat example, we had a discussion uh, over the past few weeks about anonymity in there in the uh, reader comments. And the idea is basically um, anonymity uh, will allow more commentary in the sense that people feel safer to comment, but then uh, it also uh, diminishes the accountability of what they, what they say because people don't know who they are and why they're saying it. And they can be mean. They, they can, can be, be incredibly mean. They can be bullies. They can say misinformation. They can... Yeah. Um, what, what's really uh, kind of a, a terrible new trend is, like I said, that people will will gather in these um, groups and then it, like, a, like a heat mob will come down on, on people. Yeah. And that's becoming very hard for, for folks to control. Yeah, uh, the, the power of the, the counter press, if you will. Mm -hmm. So where do you stand on that? Anonymity or no anonymity? Uh, the, the, the position I've taken is it should be fully accountable for what you say and um, my, my suggestion is that people basically register to leave comments just like they used to do somewhat with the letters of the editor. You yeah. know, you would say your name, your address, your phone number, yeah. and then the uh, editor would check all that information and call you up and say, are you so-and-so, and did yeah. you write this letter? And then if you say yes, then although that's not a perfect system, because there have been abuses of that, that did uh, somewhat limit the, the um, kind of anonymous attacks. Yeah. And uh, people generally felt like if they were going to say something, in public like that, they should stand by their words. And so that's where I, um, where I think we should go. Yeah, well, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think at the beginning um, of the internet, the beginning of electronic journalism, uh, there was this notion is let make it, let's make it free. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's free, it's unfettered, unrestrained. Free and anonymous. Any, free and anonymous, mm -hmm. anybody can say anything. But by then, at that time, we, we hadn't seen the bullying yet. We right. didn't know how it could be manipulated and abused. Mm -hmm. And then we have found that since, and so we've got to we've got to contain it. For yeah, the I mean, of everyone. Right. It, I mean, it makes sense to me. Like, I understand the place for anonymity, and so in the one of the arguments that people will make is, well, how, how do you deal with whistleblowers, and how do you deal with um, people trying to say things that they're and they're not comfortable saying them in public because of some retaliation? And uh, I would say the answer is then you, on a case-by-case -case basis, argue that and give the person anonymity if you feel like it's appropriate. Don't, you, know, you don't have to use such a, a broad brush on it. Yeah. And um, I, 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 number one, I don't see a lot of reader comments that are big whistleblower claims. I think those are handled in different channels, yeah. so I think that's somewhat of a false argument. But if there was and people said, okay, I would like to post this uh, on this story, but I don't feel comfortable using my name, 
then I think uh, the media organization could easily um, blot that out or, w or whatever they want to do yeah, to, yeah. To, to allow the comment, but then also be responsible for its content. Yeah, so they have a certain amount of due diligence there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. well, let's take a short break, Brad, then we'll come back and uh, we'll talk about where this is all going. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, predict the future. <laughs> Hey everybody, my name is David Chang and I'm the new host of a new show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you secrets on giving yourself the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests and great mentors of mine from the political, military, business, nonprofit, you name it. So it's something for everybody. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. We live stream every Tuesday from noon to 12.30. You get a chance to hear what people are doing about sustainability in Hawaii and what the issues are impacting all of us in all the islands. Join us, please. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30, we highlight success stories in Hawaii of both businesses and individuals. We learn their secrets to success, which is always valuable. I hope to see you on our next show. Aloha. We're here with Brett Obergaard. He's an assistant professor in the UH School of Communications, uh, the journalism program there. And he participated in a roundtable discussion last week at the East West Center uh, covering the recent change in the news media in Honolulu. And there have been many. Uh, but I wanted to I wanted to catch this one thing with you, um, and that is, uh, you know, wh where is it going in terms of, you know, the political dialogue that we have, especially here in election season, uh, where, you know, it used to be you read the print press, you informed yourself, they tried to inform you, and to a certain extent you were informed before election day. Now there's so much chatter, there's so much noise, and you know, people people take advantage. They say things that are not true, mm -hmm. and that there's no journalistic control at all. Mm -hmm. And then when you when you multiply that out by hundreds of millions of voters, uh, what do you get? Is our society, is our democratic society, doing better in terms of an informed voter or not? Uh, no, I think we're less informed, even though we have more information in our heads. And partially that's because there's so many channels that people get confused about even what they think is true. Uh, and we also have seemed to lost a, uh, have lost a tether to the truth in our political discussions. I think both the candidates this time around um, are somewhat untethered to that. But, oh, I mean, one obviously is extremely untethered. And we're almost pathologically. But... Um, you, you know, in both cases, I've seen this increased sophistication in the kind of behind the scenes talking points, um, surrogate uh, advancement of these talking points, yes, yes. which is, I, 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 I think this has always been there, but it's much more sophisticated now. And the whole um, behind the scenes um, team putting out mis misinformation or putting out some kind of spin ha has, has gotten really hard to overcome. Yeah, it's all, it's, it's theatrics. And there's somebody doing the puppeteering from behind the stage. Now the press has the opportunity, and I mean, I think this is a growing feature, uh, maybe relatively recent years of fact checking. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody says anything and the press will, or some members of the press will fact check that and they will tell you, is it true, is it half true, is it not true at all? How, how useful, how valid is that? Do you see that as an important element in, in, the, in the, the engagement? Well, I think this is part of the whole rise of misinformation. I think journalism used to always be fact-checking. There, <laughs> there was no separation. Right. I mean, I really... It's inherent in the it process. It's inherent in every story. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. am so shocked by this um, rise of, of fact-checking, and I think part of it is is a reaction to this constant misinformation yeah. um, system that's being put into play. Yeah. Uh, so I don't, um, I don't know really what to make of it other than this is basic journalism that always should be done, so I'm, I'm not sure why we needed separate channels, but um, maybe it's more than anything a delivery um, presentation mode. Yeah, but what I've, what I've noticed, maybe it's just me, is that when the press does the fact check and comes back and says, no, no, that candidate was wrong on that, it's, and then the candidate denies the fact checking. Right. 
And so the public is left pretty confused. Very confused. As to what, what the lie was in the first place, whether the fact-checking is really accurate, and, or whether the final you know, dismissal of the fact-checking is accurate. And so the question is, how do you make people you know, get into the process, do their duty as, as civic entities you know, in a democracy? The press is directly involved in this. Um, journalism directly, it's an essential element of it. But how do you make the public truly understand? How do you clarify their thinking? I, I'm asking an impossible question, I know. Well, I mean, the answer is, uh, at some point, people are going to get tired of getting manipulated. I think it goes along with advertising or whatever. That you're constantly getting these messages to make you feel bad about yourself, or you're, you know, you're hungry, or your car's not, you know, cool enough, or whatever true. it is. Yeah. And at some point, people get, get, you know, just exhausted with that, that constant um, negativity that leads them to buy things. And I think in the political process, you get the same sort of deal where you feel like everybody's always trying to spin you and manipul yeah, manipulate true. you, then at some point you think, well, if this is really important to me, and not every issue can be really important, it has to be like, this is the issue, or these are the issues that I think are important, then, then the person should spend the time investigating them and finding out what, what is the real truth. So how do, well, uh, okay, so I'm sitting at the television because that's an easy way to be a couch potato, and, and I see CNN, which I no longer have the same credibility for, and I see Fa Fox, which I have very little credibility for, and so forth, and they're just spinning messages at me. And, and they do that for three or four minutes, and then I get three or four or five minutes of commercials, mm -hmm. which is just as you say, they're spinning messages at mm -hmm. me, and I feel like I'm being assaulted with all these messages, and there's not a great deal of difference between the spin over here and the spin over there. And I say, enough. So and I can come down here, I can face <laughs> the cameras and say, you've got to stop doing this. That doesn't really help. No. Or I can go and, and I can go to the, the Oracle, a real source, a source that I trust, a source that will clarify this for me. What is that source? Where do I find it in today's world of journalism and media? Well, I mean, part of it's a media literacy issue where um, people trust Jimmy's blog as much as the New York Times, and they're not comparable. So, um, we, like in our program, we spend a lot of time on media literacy and news literacy, and what are the sources you can trust, and what, are the, what is the process they go through to put this information in your hands. And there's a big difference between what any, you know, any citizen can put on their blog and, and what it takes to get a story on the front page of the New York Times. And just a dramatic difference. Now people, I've heard argue about the bias of the New York Times, which is uh, fine to argue, but also you have to say, well, compared to what? And um, in, in my mind, there are you know, a few organizations around the country that really diligently look at what they put in every single word, and then um, those are the places that I feel like I can trust uh, you, you know, on most, most subjects. How do you know? How do you know that they're doing that? How, how do you come to trust them? I mean, Donald Trump would, would tell you the New York Times is bad journalism. Right. Um, so, gee, I, I hope nobody buys that. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you know that you should trust this, this uh, news media and not that one? Well, it's a process of, you know, how transparent are they? How do they get their information? How is this sourced? What, uh, when they use a source, what is the credential of that source? How fair are they in uh, you know, countering uh, any particular argument? So it's not fair time for, for, for um, different ideas like evolution versus non-evolution. It's more um, if there is a legitimate um, difference of opinion on this particular issue, does this journalistic source give, give fair time to those issues or does it try to slant them? You know, I'm, I'm reminded of my own uh, education. I forget where it, it happened, but I remember having a class in school about reading the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And they, it was a whole semester, just reading the newspaper. How you fold it, <laughs> what you look for, mm -hmm. um, what you expect from the writing, what you expect from the, where you went first and second and third and all that. Mm -hmm. And it was largely based around the New York Times and I was, grew up in New York, mm -hmm. uh, the, the papers in New York and the national papers. But uh, I don't think they have classes like that, in, in, um, aside from journalism classes themselves, in, in school anymore. Wouldn't that help? 
Uh, wouldn't education about critical thinking, you know, in, in appreciating journalistic sources, wouldn't that help? I think it would. I think it, I think they are um, starting to implement that in in school all the way down to elementary school. I have I have uh, a daughter in elementary school, and she's learning about um, media, watching the the uh, you know news that's been sanctioned for elementary school people to watch, and and they talk about the news. And uh, I also have a daughter in middle school and a daughter in high school, and they all are are um, getting this information and analyzing it, which I think is great because most of our life is uh, seen through media. I mean, our first-hand experience is very minimal when you really think about it. I mean, you sit on your couch, like you said, or you get in your car, or you sit in your uh, workplace, or whatever it is, and that's your first-hand experience. But most of what you know about the world is, is through uh, mediated um, uh, sources. Yeah. So to understand how those mediated sources work on you, and also I think uh, the main thing is they, they distort reality in, in very dramatic ways. Yeah. And if you're not aware of the filtering and distortion, then even if you are aware of it, it's, it still can't see past some of the meta narratives. Yeah. And as a, as a body politic or a body electorate, you know, we are being educated through mm -hmm. the media mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. We are forming opinions about people, about issues, about our relationship with government. Um, you know, our society is, is individually and collectively be de defined by what we get from the media. Mm -hmm. And we're getting more, as you said, more information all the time. This, this is, this is, there's a certain jeopardy in this, right? It, it seems that we are more covered by it and more threatened by it than we ever were. We need it, and yet we can't trust it. And if we don't, if we don't handle it right, our society is no longer mm, as valid as the founders would have would have liked, uh, especially well, on yeah. voting day, election. Day. Right, right. I mean, I think uh, there's always been that openness to all types of information. If you think back to maybe the founding of the country, you would have multiple newspapers in a town all telling you different things, and people had to find their way through it. So, in some respects, it's not that much different, but and we just have way more information. Yeah. So I think the real challenge is for every citizen to uh, spend time and effort on that media and figuring out what, what it means and what you can trust and, you know, where it's coming from. It's not just a trifling thing that you, you know, you spend five minutes in the morning reading the newspaper anymore. It's all day long. You're in your mobile moments at the bus stop or whatever looking at the media uh, on Facebook. Uh, a lot of times... People will get information forwarded from their friends, and because it came from their friends, they give it a higher trust level than they would if they just encountered it searching the internet. And so there are all sorts of dynamics at play that really um, make it a challenge. And I think people need to kind of uh, either either they need to step up their um, effort in in understanding the media, or they're going to get washed over by it. Yeah, and one thing is for sure, there are people out there who are trying to reshape it as we speak who will come up with new and brilliant and profitable ideas to change the whole landscape that you guys talked about last week and that we've been talking about today. And that makes it so exciting and threatening <laughs> and demanding of all of us. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I try to keep an optimistic, positive view in the sense that we have way more agency than we've ever had. Yeah. We have uh, the ability to connect with sources, international, national, regional, local, and, and really try to figure it out. But it takes work. It takes work. It's not just as simple as it used to be where you watch the 5 o'clock news or, and, and Walter Cronkite told you how it was or you picked up the daily newspaper and it was all true. <laughs> it's just not that simple anymore. No, but one thing is clear. We should read Civil Beat on Mondays to see what you have to say about it. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> Red Overgaard of the uh, UH School of Communications uh, Journalism Program. Thank you. So